Kia ora. Welcome. Welcome to this lecture organized by the World Commission on Environmental Law. My name is Klaus Bosselmann. I'm director of the New Zealand Center for Environmental Law at the University of Auckland and also chair of the Ecological Law and Governance Association. So what might we taking from the notion of ecological law. This is the subject of my talk. Uh, what is it and how is it different from environmental law? Ecological law provides the legal framework or paradigm for our age, the Anthropocene. Rather than locating the natural world as the other and disconnected from the human world, Ecological law emphasizes the interdependence and intrinsic value of all forms of life. This makes it different from environmental law, um, with, which assumes a categorical difference between uh, humans and nature. The word environment, from French environ, the surroundings, indicated, indicates what I mean. It describes a situation where we see ourselves in the center, surrounded by things, surrounded by the word out there. In the German language, my native language, we refer to the Umwelt, surroundings. And when I studied Umweltrecht in the 1980s in Germany, I was never comfortable with the very notion Umweltrecht. Um, and rather settled with the reasoning of some of the more progressive um, teachers, philosophers. Uh, Christopher Stone, I would like to mention here, emphasizing something else and saying, really we're talking about, in Germany, say, Mitwelt, with word, the word that we belong to. So I came accustomed to the idea of me studying and later on practicing and teaching Mitweltrecht, or ökologisches Recht, ecological law. Um, the term ecology captures the interconnectedness of the human world with the natural world much better. Ecology is the study of the relationship between living organisms, including humans, and their physical environment, but also in their interconnectedness. So we are really talking about ecological systems that humans are part of, and not some environment that we are separated from. You may ask, why do we be so careful here with terms? Do words really matter? What matters in law for most is content, um, doctrines, uh, rules, principles, regulations. They can be expressed in many ways, and I would agree with that. But sometimes, just sometimes, words do matter because they represent something that we might find is confusing rather than clarifying. In law, we need clarity in how we express certain obligations and rights and so on. So that's where the importance really of the brief reflection that I will do now on environmental law comes in. Environmental law, as we know it, is around the, emerged in the 19th, around the 1970s. Around that year, most countries in the world had general frameworks to protect the natural environment through policies and laws. Um, today, 50 years later, we can say that uh, many countries, in fact, 176 countries currently, have um, um, environmental protection or even the right to a healthy environment as part of their constitution. Uh, further, 150 countries have enshrined um, environmental protection mechanisms, both in constitutional and judicial arrangements in a more sort of sophisticated man manner. Roughly 150 countries have formalized agencies, ministers for the environment, in charge of the whole um, environmental protection area. And yet, um, we see worldwide 
with the sophisticated system of environmental law, uh, we are seeing alarming rates, obviously, of um, deforestation, um, climate change, biodiversity loss, in fact, a degrading of the global environment. We are overstepping our planetary boundaries. There are many reasons why this is so. Um, why, in particular, we also see the large-scale failure of environmental law. The lack of implementation comes to mind, lack of political will, of course, and so on. But underpinning all of these are uh, systemic issues, I believe. Ultimately, the lack of understanding how important nature is and how we as humans need to define our relationship with nature. The good news is that ecological awareness has grown over the last uh, 40, 50 years. And today we have, of course, a situation where most people accept that humans are part of and parcel of the Earth's ecological system. We are totally connected with what's going on in the natural world, as, for example, climate change and COVID-19 reminds us. The problem is that this awareness has not yet translated to tangible policies and laws reflective of ecological realities. The same is true, of course, for other systems of society, not just the legal system, but let's take a brief look at the economic system. Again, 50 years ago, this discourse started whether our current economic system, whether socialism or capitalism, are adequately equipped to cope with ecological problems. And the first major author of a book that tried to answer the question, Barry Commoner, in 1971, uh, published the book uh, Closing Circle, a critique of the US economy, as contradicting to what he calls the laws of ecology. Commander described the famous four laws of ecology. Number one, everything is connected to everything else. So there's one ecosphere for all living organisms, and what affects one affects all. Two, everything must go somewhere. There's no waste in nature, and there's no way to which things can be thrown. Number three, nature knows best. Humankind has fashioned technology to improve nature, but any such attempts, certainly so far, have failed, and I would argue must fail, because they ignore the enormous complexities of ecological processes. And number four, there is no free lunch. Exploitation of nature will inevitably convert healthy systems to unhealthy living conditions. So for an economic uh, system to become sustainable, so commoners argument, it must obey the laws of ecology and operate within them, not against the ecological system. This theory became known as ecological economics. Ecological law follows exactly the same logic. Just as the ecological system determines possibilities and limitations of a sustainable economic system, it also de de uh, determines possibilities and limitations of a sustainable social system. So the task of law is to set the parameters um, in a social system in order to develop in a sustainable manner. If society is to become sustainable, the law must develop, and these parameters need to be enforced. And they need to reflect the laws of ecology. The first legal scholar making sense of this, not necessarily informed by ecological thinking, but certainly by careful observation of the shortcomings of environmental law, was Christopher Stone, the US-American a uh, lawyer with his legendary um, essay, Should Trees Have Standing, in 1972. 
um, in which he stated that throughout the development of Western civilization, morality has increasingly expanded. And our morality has grown to a degree now that it would be conceivable to see that not just human beings, but also the non-human world, the natural world, uh, should be incorporated in our morality, the subject of environmental ethics. In legal terms, Stone suggested that our concern for the intrinsic value, as opposed to the instrumental value towards nature, can be expressed in uh, rights of nature. And of course, this in itself uh, became a great force, or you could say a movement, the rights of nature movement. Over the years, we have seen certain manifestations of rights of nature based obviously on a new ethic, on non-anthropocentric or ecocentric or biocentric ethical concepts. Promoted in many countries, I'm sure there's hardly any exception on the planet of countries not being challenged by activists and legal activists to consider the necessity and the merits of implementing rights of nature. Examples when it comes to enshrining into constitutions include Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia. Uh, court decisions along those lines are known from India, Bangladesh, other states, and legislation, in particular New Zealand, but also some com local communities in the United States. So they all are uh, aiming for advocate, aiming for the advocacy of a new morality, inclusive of, inclusive of nature, translated to legal constructs and ultimately to far more effective protection policies. Um, ecological law is obviously part of this movement right from the start, but ecological law is broader. Because rights of nature are not the only means to advocate and apply ecological law. Other examples, very briefly, could um, be seen in even existing developments of international environmental law. After all, in 1992, at the Rio Earth Summit, the Rio Declaration on Environment Development Principle 7 obliged states to cooperate in order to protect the integrity of Earth's ecological systems. And this duty to cooperate in order to protect the integrity of ecological systems repeats itself in language in no less than 27 international agreements, mostly soft law, but also some hard law, um, and hard law agreements, such as, the, for example, the Paris Agreement from on climate change from 2015. So they have it, the integrity of ecological systems, not the functionality, the usefulness, the integrity for its own sake, because the ecosystems have their own needs and morally speaking their own intrinsic value and individual organisms have intrinsic value, intrinsic needs. So we have it expressed in international agreements, yet of course overlooked because we have not seen a follow up in sort of more tangible government policies, initiatives, uh, it's been forgotten. I'm always amazed how uh, when you talk to politicians and representatives of states on occasions here and there in negotiations, whether they've ever thought about the notion of the integrity of ecological systems. And for most, uh, from my perspective, um, it was new or overlooked or not really sort of considered to be signaling a fundamental duty that we might have as individuals and certainly as states to protect the integrity of ecological systems. Another example related to that would be the idea of trusteeship governance, that states or the United Nations or both should have a legally recognized and enforceable duty to act as trustees 
on behalf of future generations, on behalf of Earth as a whole. Because the Earth doesn't belong to anyone. It requires, however, careful governance, guardianship, best expressed in the concept of trusteeship. A number of developments have been uh, going on in recent times. I won't, won't go into it. But as a context of our conversation, let's look at environmental law again. What has environmental law really done? Um, not in terms of extra achievements, but what is the problem? Environmental law has originated in Europe in the context of Western thinking and is of course part of modern Western law. And the origins of the Western law are in, you know, in uh, certain ethical questions. Dualism, for example, the assumption that nature and, and humans are categorically separated rather than in some form of relationship, dialectic or otherwise. So dualism, one very important driver. Of course, related to this, anthropocentrism, the human-centeredness that I mentioned earlier, or individualism, and so the more recent experience of 200 years, the extreme view that, you know, the individual is the only thing that matters, and any kind of collective belonging, belonging to a greater collective of as humans and to nature, um, is being shifted to the periphery of our awareness. Or ethically speaking, utilitarianism, the usefulness of nature matters. So in this way, environmental law has actually been shaped in an anthropocentric, reductionist and fragmented manner, largely blind to ecological realities, but also politically weak because environmental law continues to compete with other areas of law, as you know, and of course most prominently property rights, corporate rights, concepts of state sovereignty, and so on. Um, so surely we need to get a understanding and a commitment towards what's called the greening of law at large. We can't just have environmental law here and then the, pretty much the opposite there. There needs to be a coherence of the various legal fields based on the observation that the ecological system of planet Earth is fundamental to all forms of life, including human life. So we must start from there. Um, so ecological law is trying to conceptualize this approach. And I mentioned a few examples. I could go on with many other um, uh, developments, but I might just refer you to a website, www.erga.org. Erga sets for Ecological Law and Governance Association, where you find information about webinars, about activities in many countries that are going on conferences and publications and so on. Um, but ecological law, and this is what I want to say and highlight at the end of this talk, is really more than just law. It really stands for and advocates a, a mindset, a change of mindset. Uh, and when we think about the possibilities and the opportunities that we have in order to learn from the ecological crisis, I think it's always a good idea to be aware of where we are coming from, not only negatively speaking, which I just indicated, but also positively speaking. Even within the Western context, of course, there was always an alternative of thinking in a more holistic manner. Spinoza, the famous philosopher who inspired many thinkers, including Goethe um, and um, more, the German Romantic, uh, but not just confined to the uh, German Romantic movement, which is, of course, a certain critique to the over, overly rational Enlightenment movement. Very fascinating developments to be observed. Only want to touch upon it. There is a rich tradition within Western thinking, which today we would be describing as eco the origins of ecological thinking. And when I say Western thinking, I'm not excluding non-Western thinking to the contrary, but I'm pretty much at ease that non-Western cultures all around the world are far more richer 
in uh, still harboring the understanding of connectedness. So we should be, should be aware that all cultures, including the Western cultures, traditionally was informed by our by the belonging of humans to, to nature, and this has guided us for centuries. After all, we wouldn't even be here if this kind of care for the environment and nature today expressed as guardianship or trusteeship uh, wasn't there. So there is a tradition that we need to be very mindful of and see what industrialism, economic growth paradigms, capitalism, in one variation is socialism, there's no fundamental exception, um, difference between those two, but we have to realize what we have done to ourselves, to the future of um, our humanity and, and uh, non-human species, based on, on certain rather limiting ideas that we are now having the chance to really revisit and overcome. After all, ecological thinking um, also is very heavily supported by contemporary science. Think of ecology itself, or biology, but, uh, but you know, Earth system science is probably a very important, influential movement of scientists explaining us how the various ecospheres and biospheres and various ecosystems are interacting to together make up one single system called planet Earth. Or think of health sciences. There is an increasing awareness re-nurtured through the current pandemic that you cannot meaningfully distinguish between environmental health, human health, planetary health. The virus is, of course, a very powerful reminder of our, our connectedness with nature in a negative way here in this instance, but of course as a result of the way how we have organized our societies, overlooking the need of protecting habitats, in this instance wilderness, um, and blurring the line between human developments and um, wilderness the natural world in some ways, in some parts of the world. So, to conclude, what we are dealing with is really the idea that we are um, uh, revisiting um, and embracing at the same time an understanding of our belonging to the natural world in a way that we can conduct a rational discourse about, we can express it in political terms, in theoretical terms, but also in legal terms. In essence, in essence ecological law frames our thinking in a way that um, reflects traditional values of connectedness with nature, but equally leading edge science, as mentioned. I'm convinced that we will see the shifting from what I capture as an environmental protection idea to an ecological concept of protection, including both humans and nature. We see this shift sooner or later, but of course it may be too late if you're not acting. So I would certainly urge you to consider the underpinning ideas of what I call and others have called ecological law and be encouraged by the incredible movements, the powerful movements of the, of the young generation in particular, of course focusing on climate change. But I sense through many conversations and also through the uh, reflection in the media that what's going on here is a call for a rethinking, a fundamental rethinking. We have been going the wrong direction for too long now, and it's time to frame our thinking to organize societies by ecological parameters, with ecological parameters as foundational. And in the context of law, this is the promise of ecological law and governance. Thank you for your attention. I hope to be able to continue conversations with you, either directly or indirectly, but of course there is a worldwide network with so many activist groups and individuals 
that I'm sure you will be able to connect yourself or otherwise stay in touch with me and our, and our network, the Ecological Law and Governance Association. So, Kia Hara, Namihi from New Zealand and goodbye.